Hello, welcome to The Conversation on New Central Television. This is the program where we bring you all the latest political happenings on the continent and Benga Aburoa. And I am Rita Omodia. It's another day for The Conversation right here on New Central TV. And today on The Conversation, we'll be looking at situations in Ghana. Yes, no, we're not talking about uh, the march of yesterday between Nigeria and Ghana. And of course, the fact that Super Eagles of Nigeria failed to qualify for the 2022 mm. World Cup, I mean, it was a really uh, serious situation yesterday because we yeah, had a lot saw, of expectations for Nigeria. Yeah, and of course, uh, we have to condemn the vandalism Definitely. Uh, in the stadium in Abuja. I mean, it's sports. You win some, you lose some. Uh, I mean. Let's all support African representatives with one voice in Qatar. Uh, coming this uh, December. Definitely, yeah. that's it. One love there. I mean, spirit of sportsmanship there. Whoever wins, whoever loses, I mean, it's just a game. And of course, we do commiserate with the families of uh, those of the man who lost his life. That's a calf doctor at the stampede yesterday, which was caused uh, the resulting effect of the fans which uh, attacked Invaded. the stadium yes. pitch at the Abuja uh, Murtala Mohammed uh, MK um, of Yola Stadium, stadium. rather in Abuja. But we'll not be discussing about that today, but we'll be looking at situations in Ghana where we have the passing of the controversial E-level bill. And we will also discuss issues around Democratic Republic of Congo joining the East African community. Now, the Ghanaian parliament has approved a new electronic transaction tax, which the government says will help raise $900 million in much needed revenue but which has sparked widespread popular criticism. The e-levy bill it passed on Tuesday would introduce a 1.5% tax on electronic money transfers and transactions. Ghanaian President, uh, President Nana Akufo Addo's government has said the move will address problems from unemployment to Ghana's high debt profile. But for many Ghanaians, the tax represents yet another burden as the already struggling with high living costs heightened by soaring fuel prices due to the Ukraine crisis. Legislators passed the law as the opposition minority walked out of the debate. Joining us to discuss this on the conversation today is Mutaru Mumuni Mukhtar, Executive Director of West Africa Center for Counter Extremism. Uh, a warm welcome to you, uh, Mukhtar. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this. Thank you. So now, last year, Ghana's lawmakers got into a brawl in Parliament over a proposed tax on electronic transactions. What is the E-Level Bill and why is it so contentious? Well, I want to begin by saying that yesterday was a very good day for the president and for the ruling government. Yesterday was his 78th birthday. And yesterday, uh, the national team, you know, qualified for the World Cup, you know, in Qatar. Of course, here we say we didn't beat Nigeria. Nigeria failed to beat or to qualify. Yesterday, a big project in the northern part of the country was commissioned by the president. Mm. And yesterday, the electronic transactions levy was passed by parliament. And so it was a good day for the ruling government. This electronic transaction levy is intended at mopping up extra liquidity, extra revenues from the domestic economy to deal with, you know, a growing high level of public debt by the government, you know, to ensure that they would be able to carry out projects that have been outlined in the 2022 budget. The electronic transaction levy covers electronic transactions uh, relating to mobile money transfers and bank transfers, you know, uh, amongst various or different users. It was initially pegged at 1.7% of gross transactions, but as we see yesterday, it was reduced to 1.5% of total transactions. This Levy has met with strong opposition. It's a very, very unpopular you know, policy or decision by the government. Significantly, the majority of the Ghanaian public is against this levy. It doesn't matter whether you belong to the 
you know, the ruling party or the opposition party. We've seen significant mm. voices against this levy. There have been several polls locally conducted by some media houses and other agencies that reveal that this is a very unpopular you know, policy by the government. And of course, as the government finding itself in a very difficult situation with huge public debt, very limited resources or revenues, um, you're looking at all kinds of you know, avenues to be able to rake in the needed you know, revenues to you know, ensure they carry out development projects during the year. And there is a very, very, you know, high level of expectation. There's increasing pressure on the government to deliver because this government came into power with huge, mm -hmm. you know, level of expectation, very ambitious programs and projects, including, you know, one district, one uh, factory. You know, they're intending to move the nation from uh, an aid-dependent nation to a nation beyond aid. And so several programs have been created around it. And yet COVID and international events, including the recent the in Ukraine. Ukraine crisis yeah. and COVID collectively have impacted negatively on the economy. And you will see the desperation of the government today to ensure that they do deliver on their promise. A few days ago, the president you know, announced the reopening of borders to allow economic activities, commerce to take over, to ensure that it would stimulate the local economy and would ensure a revamping of the economy. So all these things are built around the desire of government to carry out their development programs outlined in the 2022 budget. Okay, thank you, Motaru. Now, yesterday, legislators passed the law after opposition uh, minority walked out of the debate. Why did the lawmakers decide to stage a walkout? And was this instrumental in the passing of the bill? Because it, it was passed with a voice uh, with a voice vote. From the first day, the opposition had been very, very clear on their position on this uh, levy. And they have protested the e-levy at all forums, including parliament, media platforms, and on the streets. You know, and we saw things came to a head, you know, last December when it ended in physical fights in parliament. Mm -hmm. And so the opposition has shown strongly their opposition to the e-levy. What we saw yesterday, of course, we're still learning in terms of the details coming out yeah. regarding the decision to walk out, what we are hearing is that the opposition did not have adequate numbers to oppose it in terms of vote. And so the most you know, ideal thing to do was to walk out. But in addition to that, uh, the numbers of the ruling government in parliament yesterday did not make up for the required number of parliamentarians needed as, in terms of quorum to take a decision. There was a, a recent Supreme Court ruling that pointed to the fact that you needed to have a majority of members of mm -hmm. parliament present and in vote to be able to make a decision valid. And in this case, a week or by that, the workout was a strategic calculation mm -hmm. intended to nullify what happened in parliament yesterday. And we're seeing already some move by parliament, the opposition party, you know, at the Supreme Court, they are seeking to challenge that by the Supreme Court's own earlier ruling in terms of the quorum to make a decision on, on a subject like this. And so I believe that this is the reason uh, for walking out of parliament yesterday. Now, Mukta, aside from the walking out of the opposition lawmakers, earlier on you mentioned how some of the advantages of this e-levy bill and, of course, uh, the government using this as an opportunity to raise more funds. But what about the Guineans on the street? Do they really see it as a contributing uh, a fair share towards the development of, uh, of Ghanaians as a whole, as proposed by the finance minister, that's Ken Ofori Atta? Do they really welcome this development? 
Like I said earlier, all polls point to the fact that this is a very unpopular um, and welcome policy by the government. And so if this is meant to, I mean, to put, put this to a vote, it would not pass. The majority of the Ghanaian population are very livid. They are very angry at this. Even just before the World Cup took off in Nigeria yesterday, we saw you know, many members, especially young people, take to social media just at the passing of this law. People talking about boycotting the World Cup and anything that has to do with you know, the government's programs. It is a very unpopular program. And I do not think even the projections that has been made by the finance minister would be realized because already many people are seeking to opt out of mobile money services. So more, many mobile money accounts are going to be deactivated. Many mobile money operators are going to have less revenues because less numbers of people would be going to do mobile money transactions. And so it's a very, very unpopular uh, policy here. And of course, we are hearing uh, some hint about hitting the streets, which I know would be, you know, of little effect in terms of its capacity to reverse what has happened in Parliament. Nonetheless, it is a very unpopular policy now. Now, Mutara, I know this is a hypothetical question, but uh, if Ghanaians did not, if the Black Stars of Ghana didn't qualify for the World Cup yesterday, do you think uh, Ghanaian youths would have directed their anger uh, towards addressing this issue, do you think there would have been a uh, street protest to, you know, oppose uh, this e-levy bill? I tell you, this is a very big footballing nation, and a lot of people, you know, are so much, so much into football that something like this, I can tell you, in the last, you know, since last night, has significantly captured the attention of the local population. If we hadn't qualified for the World Cup, I told you, the airways would have been very much, very, very, I mean, hot. It would have been very heated in terms of public anger against the bill. Even though we still have, it would have been much, much higher uh, than what we're seeing now. Now, just to follow up on what Rita said earlier, Rita did talk about uh, the finance minister of Oriata saying, you know, the Ghanaians, this is your contribution to the development of the country. But the government has also come out, the president and his ministers uh, recently also cut their own wages by 30%, along with other measures they hope will help generate $400 million in savings for state coffers. How significant is this uh, move, this sacrifice by the government's side, 30% of their salary? Do you think uh, it's, it's big enough uh, or it's just a PR exercise in other uh, to make it seem like the government is making sacrifices? To be honest, apart from the very difficult economic situation the country finds itself in, one of the single biggest sources of rejection of the e-levy is the fact that many people do not think that the government or government is deserving of that kind of levy, is deserving of that kind of support from the local population in terms of revenue generation. Because many people do not think that government has legitimately accounted you know, for the revenues that they continue to receive. There's the perception of increasing waste of public resources. There's an increasing perception of plunder and brigandry relating to the use of public resources. And that is a significant source of the rejection of the e-levy. What government has done in terms of you know, pay cut, of course, it's meant to be able to build some goodwill to get the e-levy you know, supported. But I think it has come quite, late, quite too late, and many people do not seem moved by the gesture by government in terms of cutting down their own salaries. Uh, what we're seeing is a population that has become very fatigued with government and government expenditure. And so it is something that is that should have been able to build that kind of goodwill and support from the local population, but I'm not seeing those sentiments expressed yet locally.
Yeah, I know we had uh, this uh, convener for the Fix the Country, that's Oliva Mawusi Bako Vamo, and he was arrested earlier last year, uh, earlier this year rather, and he said he would stage a coup himself if this E-level bill is passed. So what do you think is going to happen now that finally it has been passed by the lawmakers? I think that Oliver is a typical, you know, very quintessential kind of activist. And so you need to really read in between the lines uh, to make meaning out of some of the things he talks about. I do not think or believe that Oliver um, actually meant staging physically a coup. I think he was looking at how to create a, you know, a, a big sense of revolt against the system when the e levy is passed. And so I don't think that he meant literally passing, you know, get involved in a physical coup situation. Of course, he's been uh, released on bail now. And I've seen in the last few hours, he's made some posts around the, e the passing of the e levy And he's talking about some possible uh, civil protest or uh, action on the streets. And then that is what I think, I mean, uh, many people will be expecting to see or hear from him. Now, Mutaru, um, the finance minister, Ken Oforiat, has said the government has already reduced uh, the proposed tax from 1.75 to 1.5 percent, which you alluded to after consultations, adding that it will bring the project revenues, uh, projected revenues of 927.5 million dollars. My question to you is this, is the e-levy the only alternative available to the government to shore up revenues and as the government uh, dropped its ambitious project of planning to build a cathedral that would cost Ghanaian taxpayers a hundred million dollars? As we speak now, the single biggest worry for government is the unsustainable level of debt. The debt stock of this country, it is, it is high and it's unsustainable. And so government is not looking to go into the international market or the bond market to pile up more debt. That would make the country economically very precarious. And so, and if you look at in line with, you know, government developmental agenda, looking at moving Ghana beyond aid, it means that you're looking at, you're looking inwardly to mobilizing local resources for developmental programs. And so the expectation is that we'll be looking at local resources and opportunities to mobilize resources to develop. And if you consider that we have very limited opportunities available now, government sees the introduction of the e-levy as the most effective and most reliable process or approach to generating the revenue needed to develop in this, I mean, in terms of carrying out their developmental programs this year. What's uh, the status of the cathedral? Know. Sorry. What's the status of the cathedral? I'm sure Ghanaians will tell you it's not uh, such a big priority in this precarious times. Of course, the, 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 the cathedral was made met with significant rejection from the local population. But of course, as we know, religious matters are quite, you know, very emotive. And so you will still find a significant number of the local population being supportive of it. And it appears that we seem to have forgotten quite soon uh, how much it was as in terms of its controversy. Uh, but at the moment, the focus and attention has been built around the introduction of the e-levy and what it seeks to do for the economy. The finance minister seemed to be out of ideas in terms of opportunities for generating mm. more revenue for the country. And so the ELV is a quick resort and an easier approach in terms of mobilizing more resources to develop, you know, to carry out their developmental agenda for the year. All right, when we look at the E-Levy bill and other taxes in other countries, would you say that this amount, because you said before it was about 1.75%, but it was reduced to 1.5%, do you feel it's moderate enough considering uh, the current economic situation in Ghana? Uh, it's not up to me to say it personally, but I, if you look at, I mean, if you listen to commentary on the streets, there's a significant portion of the Ghanaian population that feels that this is unfair and this is counterproductive on many accounts. 
One, lady in you know, lower uh, level income earners, the poor who rely on mobile money banking or services instead of the traditional banking system, and it's not fair. And you're actually um, excluding them from participating in the financial space. Further than that, you are excluding them from participating in the digital space. And this is a government that seems to premise their uh, developmental and strategic agenda, development agenda on the digital economy and digitalization of governance. And so if you tax people for participating in the digital space, you are undermining your own development programs and strategic agenda. And so on many accounts, we are not very pleased of, of this e -living. Now, just before we begin to wrap things up, Matara, just last month, International Credit Ratings Agency, uh, Moody, recently downgraded Ghana from B3 to CAA1 with a stable outlook on the long-term issuer and senior unsecured bond ratings. Uh, the president of Ghana, His Excellency Nana Kufo Addo, uh, condemned it as an attempt by the ratings agencies to impede the progress of his government in assessing funds to develop the country. Motaro, what is the true and current state of the Ghanaian economy, politics apart? Well, of course, I'm not an economist, but what we're seeing is an economy that is in financial distress, an economy that seems quite unattractive to foreign investors. And if you look at the treasury bill yields and, you know, the developments around the money markets here. Even the value of the CD, yes. Even the value of the CD has taken a hit. Exactly. So it doesn't point to an economy that is attractive enough for foreign investors. And so um, it does not put the president and the government in a good position to reach out to in this international market for bonds or any form of you know, foreign investment. And so if you listen to the president, he's been you know, being ambitious and very um, aggressive in how he projects this country to be able to attract the foreign investment needed to spare growth in the economy. Uh, his protest to, you know, the ratings, of course, uh, it's predictable. That is a significant damage you can do to any economy from international sources because international investors will take you, they'll be taking lessons from it, they'll be taking directions from those reports and that would not reflect well on the Ghanaian economy. And so you would find the president, you know, not you know, um, accepting those reports and actually attacking or criticizing the, the reports. Now, Mukhtar, you mentioned how much of unpopular this bill is. What would you have expected from the Ghanaian economy and even the finance minister, rather the, the Ghanaian government and even the finance minister to help uh, show up more revenue for the government? For a long time, we've been talking about um, a very small proportion of the Ghanaian workforce within, you know, the tax net. And so the, the talk has been about how do you expand the tax mm. net to include, uh, you know, the informal sector. Mind you, the economy is, a, is largely an informal economy with many people out of the tax net. How do you bring all those elements into the tax net, not in necessarily increasing the tax rate, but the, the tax net means the numbers of people who would be put in the position to pay taxes. And it looks like it has been a daunting task. It's been a very um, difficult and I mean, failed attempt several years. And so the e levy appears to be an easy approach to it because if you're, I mean, if you're already in the digital space, it's, it's easy to tar target you. And that's what the finance minister is seeking to do. And that's what he's seeking, to, how he's seeking to raise revenues to be able to prosecute a developmental agenda for this year. Now, finally, what's the take of the opposition NDC on this? And uh, how soon do you expect the president to grant his assent? Or uh, has there been any move to take this uh, to court? Yes, so the opposition is making preparations to go to court to challenge the decision of yesterday in terms of approving the e-levy. Uh, the government is very bent on approving the e-levy by the presidential assent. And I, I believe strongly by the close of the year, I mean, the close of the week, we would have the president act on it. Uh, I don't know what the court outcome would be or even how soon that would be mm. in terms of his decision on what happened yesterday. But we would very, very soon 
see the president acting on it because nearly the entire development agenda for this year rests on the e levy an e levy that is projected to bring in about 900 million ghana cities of course 900 million ghana cities is a very small amount of money uh, relative to the ghanaian economy but many people believe that that very regular or reliable source of revenues could be used or will be used as collateral to be able to access uh, loans from whatever source in the international market or elsewhere within the, the, the domestic economy. I'd uh, like to say a very big thank you to you, uh, Mortaro Mumuni Mokhtar, Executive Director at the West African Centre for Counterterrorism. Thanks for sharing your insights with us. And we'll definitely keep our eyes and events in Ghana. I don't think uh, we've heard the last of this e-levy bill. Thank yeah. you very much uh, for your insights. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, now we'll go for a quick break. And when we come back, we will be discussing situations right now in DR Congo as it has finally joined the East African community to stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. You're still watching the conversation right here on News as Central TV. And on the first belt of the program, we discussed the controversial e levy bill uh, in, Ga in Ghana, which the government says is proposed to raise up about $900 million for the country. But unfortunately, it has been an unpopular one. And we had a minority section of the lawmakers actually walk out when the bill was being passed. And now for the second belt, we'll be discussing issues in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which was officially admitted as the seventh member state of the East African community on Tuesday, March 29, during the 19th Extraordinary Summit of the EAC Heads of State, expanding the bloc's market to 280 million people spanning the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean. The East African community is a regional intergovernmental organization founded in 1967, collapsed in 1977, and revived on 7th of July 2000. It includes other member states such as Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda, South Sudan, Tanzania and Uganda. Now President Felicia Sikedi addressing the virtual 19th Extraordinary Summit. The heads of state said membership represents a mutual benefit. The Democratic Republic of Congo is the largest and most populous country to join the East African community, bring in a market of 90 million people and immediately upgrading the region's GDP from $193 billion to $240 billion. Now, we have Dr. X. N. Iraqi, an economist and faculty member of the Business and Management Sciences at the University of Nairobi, uh, join us to discuss and shed more light on the DRC's membership of the EAC. Uh, thanks for joining us, uh, Dr. Iraqi. A warm welcome to you. Hello, good evening, and how are you? Good evening. Uh, very well, thank you. Now, Dr. Iraqi, the mission of the EAC has been to widen and deepen economic, political, social and cultural integration in order to improve the quality of life of people of the East African community. How would you say, since its inception, it's been able to deliver on its mandate to the people? Do they really feel the benefits of this uh, block? I think if you, if you look at the history of East Africa, the founding fathers, Mwari um, Muzuri Azimirere, Jomo Kenyatta, and uh, others had a very good dream for East Africa. We have a lot of things in common, the language, the culture, and economic aspiration. So they saw that as the best vehicle to make this region more economic and dynamic, achieve its objectives. But there were a lot of political disagreements. That is why around 1977, the East African community broke. And about a few years later, in 2000, they revived it. And that was a very big dent in the progress to attaining its, its, its economic, political, and cultural objective. So we have not really achieved what was set out to be achieved. For one reason, because of that break. And two, a lot of East African countries, in my opinion, focus more on their country-specific problems than regional or, or regional problems. That is one reason why you want to achieve the objective. But I think the dream of the African community is still very. And I'm very excited that very soon I can drive to Mombasa, mm -hmm. through Uganda, through Rwanda, through Congo, to the Atlantic Ocean. That All right. is a dream that is varied and should be supported. 
Okay, Dr. Iraqi, you mentioned one of the advantages of the DR Congo joining the East African community. Now, while some have applauded the economic benefits of this admission, others insist the Congolese economy is not yet ready to join the East African community and that the local industry is bound to face stiff competition that could undermine local production. You're an economist. So what are your thoughts on this? Will DR Congo achieve the much-needed development based on the economies of large scale? I think that's a very debatable question because if you bring DRC to East African community, it has to compete with the existing countries, mm -hmm. with the existing industries. And since DRC might not be as developed as Kenya or other East African countries, then their products and services are likely to meet a lot of competition. But what is going to happen is that we are going to uplift DRC so that they move up, they start competing at higher level. So Congo might not be as good as the rest of the South African countries, but we can appeal to them. We can teach them how to compete. And that is very good for them. If you compete, you're likely to improve on what you offer on goods and services. That's the way I see it. Now, Dr. Iraqi, this uh, move is coming at a time when the African Union, uh, a lot of member states, have uh, ratified the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, uh, which is meant to you know, unify uh, Africa economically, why are we still uh, moving back to regional blocks? How, how does this play out in the grand scale of things? Will this uh, hamper uh, the effectiveness of AFTA or it, it has nothing to do with uh, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement? That's, that's, a good, that's a good question because a lot of African countries have that problem. If you go to West Africa, there's ECOWAS. If you go to South Africa, there is SADC. Sure. Then if you go to East Africa, there is East African community. You have countries being a member of different economic blocks. And that being, brings a bit of confusion and it becomes very expensive. So what I would want to see in the future is the South African community, ECOWAS, and so on, being integrated to African free trade area because they have the same objective. So I agree with you that we have uh, cross purposes in terms of regional blocks, but I think the end point is having all these regional blocks have part of African free trade area. All right, what does the DRC stand to gain from this uh, from this union, from this membership? Because you talked about the mobility, but for the DRC, what will it gain? DRC have not been stable for the last several years, as all of you know. So I think by joining the East African community, we have a chance to pacify Congo, because you cannot fight with the people you trade with. Mm. So once DRC joins the East African community, I expect to be, to be there more peace between DRC and Uganda, DRC and Rwanda, and DRC as neighbors. And when there is peace, I expect trade to flourish. I expect more trade from the, the East African region. And at the end of the day, Congo should be able to develop faster and become a part of the community of nations. Remember, Congo is going to have a bigger market. In fact, my dream is that very soon, you should have Somali also join the East African community. Because one way to pacify countries to make them trade with one another. Look at the European Union. Since the European Union was formed, they already have European countries fought with one another. They have right. always been making about peace and progress. And that's the example we should follow in East Africa. Now, uh, what language? Uh, I'm referring to the EAC Secretariat, which is based in Kenya, I, I believe. Uh, what will be the language of use in uh, the EAC? We've seen a situation where majority of the members speak Swahili and English, and then uh, some parts of uh, Rwanda speaks French. Uh, the DRC is French. Are we looking at a more multilingual uh, East African community? Uh, about three years ago, I remember visiting Western Uganda, West, Western Rwanda, and I went up to the border with the DRC, and was very happy to find the, the eastern part of Congo talk very good Swahili, perhaps oh. better than me. So I think once the East African community comes of age, I expect them to talk Swahili. But at the beginning, we may have to use a number of languages, French because of DRC yeah. and a bit of Rwanda, and then English. But at the end point, we need to use one language because that will make that will be a very good way to unite. But that will not happen tonight. It will take some time before we start talking one language because it has to be taught in schools, it has to be taught in colleges, and people have to learn it. Not everybody talks Swahili, but that will be the best medium of communication. Mm. Okay, a multilingual uh, community there. But the DRC says it will give the EAC its first port on the African West Coast. I mean, that's the news all over. 
what exactly, what else would the EAC gain, that, gain that's the East African community, gain from DRC joining this community? Be sincere, DRC is a very rich country. A lot of sheep, a lot of farmland, a lot of minerals. So we can benefit as neighbors to DRC from these minerals, from these farmlands. So I, I expect a lot of East African countries to start investing in DRC. Not, not with the starting that Chinese and other powers will come and invest there, but should invest there first. So we can have also transport being improved. But even, even moving something from Kenya to Nigeria, instead of going through the Cape, I can drive through Congo. Maybe we need to extend the railway line through Congo to the Atlantic coast. We need to have very good highways so that you can move from Kenya to Congo. So I see that improvement in transport as very important if Congo has to be interpreted, has to be integrated with African community. We have to do that. Mm. But I think there's a lot of synergy that we can create by having the DRC as part of the African community. I'm personally very excited. Now, Dr. Iraqi, I do share your excitement, and I, and I like the analysis that you gave that since uh, the European Union was formed, you hardly see fighting uh, between member countries. Uh, there's a way that trade allows for uh, brotherliness and uh, it allows peace to thrive because you cannot invest in an environment that is not peaceful. And that brings me to Congo. Congo uh, has been in almost a state of constant conflict for yeah. decades uh, now, and uh, Congo is not really in good terms uh, with the DRC is not really in good terms uh, with his neighbors uh, when it comes to military incursions into his territory. I'm talking about Uganda and Rwanda. The United Nations has also affirmed this, uh, that uh, the uh, Ugandan government and the Rwandese government are supporting M23 uh, rebels. Do you think DRC joining EAC is put on the cart before the horse or should they have tried to solve this military uh, issues and issues of territorial integrity uh, between the Democratic Republic of Congo and uh, Rwanda and Uganda first before uh, talking about joining this the East African community. Uh, I, in my opinion, that's the right approach. Let Congo, DRC, Congo join East African community, and then we talk as equals. We talk as brothers. We talk as sisters. Because when we try to solve that problem, when DRC is outside. They seen as an outsider. Mm. But now that Congo is a part of the second East African community, we can not, now talk more easily. We can now talk as members of one club. So I think that that, that was the right approach. Let's let DRC Congo join the East African community and solve the problem. And the same should apply to this country like Southern Sudan and hopefully very soon Somalia. All right, Dr. Iraqi, now we know that the East African Court is the one is of justice, is the judicial arm of the community. So how will this affect judicial process in DR Congo? And how soon are we to expect all this uh, fruitful gains from joining the, uh, the East African community begin to actually uh, yield fruits? I think it will not happen overnight because we have to integrate the RSC into the political, economic and social system of the old East African community. Remember, we don't have very good transport network between Uganda and Congo. Between Uganda, not between Uganda, but between Congo and the Rwanda and so on. And there's a lot of rebel movement between the neighbors. So that is not going to happen overnight. But I think gradually we are going to start seeing a lot of integration. We are going to see countries sit among, sit among themselves, talk, agree, or using dialogue on how to solve those cross-border disputes. And then we have no reason to believe that in about 10 years time, we are going to talk about the fruits and the dreams of the South African community. So I'm giving about 10 years for integration and we start seeing the gains. Dr. Iraqi, before we begin to wrap this up now, what other formalities are left? Uh, does the Congolese parliament need to ratify this? What other formalities? And how soon do we expect uh, the DRC to be officially part of the East African community? I think the, 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 the DRC Congo joining the South African community is not just a question of signing. We still need to have DRC integrated to other formalities of the South African community. We talked about the court system. We talked about yeah. the language system. We talked about uh, all other formalities that make a restitution, the currencies, the exchange rates, and so on. So we still have a lot of work to do before Congo becomes part of the South African community. We need to educate people in each of the African communities that they have a new brother. If you are a father and a mother and you have a, a new kid, 
You have to make other kids realize that there's a new brother here, there's a new sister here. You have to treat him or her well. You have to share the resources. You have to share the attention. So slowly and slowly, we are going to make Congo become part of the South African community, and everybody should benefit from it. While you celebrate uh, the EAC's uh, admission of Congo, uh, we are also optimistic here in Nigeria. And uh, one day, I hope, uh, Rita and I and friends can drive all the way to Nairobi because <laughs> the bigger picture, like you said, is to have an integrated, uh, united African uh, union uh, where you have free movement of goods and persons. And that's what uh, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement hopes to achieve. But today's conversation is not about that. I'm looking forward to coming to Nairobi in time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Iraqi. Uh, I, I want to come and take a goosey soup in Victoria yes. Island. Oh, you know and, about a goosey soup. Yeah, and then we'll <laughs> yes. come and yes, have... very nice. I love it. Yeah, we'll, we'll come and have some ugali and yamachoma in Nairobi. Ah, that is it. That is it. Benga, come, you come, like come. food too much. You mentioning all these things. You like food too much. Okay, uh, finally, I, I, I think I'll look at this leadership of the EAC. Earlier on, you mentioned uh, how much uh, the leadership of the EAC are much focus on the individual countries. So generally now, what do you think the leadership of the EAC can do to improve the community? I think if you look at Africa Agenda 2063, it's a very good framework for the new East African community to use. There are very specific goals on what Africa Agenda 2063 is all about. And I think the leaders of the East African community, the new East African community, should look at Agenda 2063 and they like the road in truth, like communication, like peer network and so on. So that when we are coming up with goals of the African community, they are in tandem with the goals of African Union. So I think it is possible for us to achieve those objectives by making sure that they are not individualistic, they are long-term. Remember the people who are going to benefit from the African community might not be us, it might be the next generation. Mm. And we must take, we must have that into consideration as we plan for the new South African community. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Exen Iraqi. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, talking to you about uh, the DRC's membership of the EAC. Thank you very much for sharing your insights and uh, knowledge with us on the subject. Have a good evening, and I look forward to my Aguzi soup. Uh, yes, yeah, <laughs> thank you're, you. you're always welcome. Uh, and I want you, the two of you, to prepare the soup. Don't outsource it. Yeah, we will. I, I, no problem, no problem. <laughs> I don't know about Bengadu, but you can trust me on it. Thank you, Dr. Oh, thank you. I, will prepare, I, will prepare, I will prepare Ugali for you, I have no problem. That is no. fine. Ugali goes well with the Aguzi soup, yes. Thank you uh, so you're much. Right <laughs> you're right on that. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, wow. Well, 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 and I, on that foodie note, uh, this is where course. we wrap things up. But a lot is happening on yeah. the continent. I did hear that uh, there's a protest that's ongoing mm -hmm. and they're still meeting fierce resistance in Sudan. Yeah. And uh, the Nigerian political space is opening up. Opening uh, up and uh, unfortunately of, uh, security too is worsening. Unfortunately, yes. I mean, we had a series of train attacks, about two train attacks. I mean, after mm -hmm. 24 hours, we had another train attack of uh, so-called bandits. And we do hope that the government and, of course, security agencies are able to forestall such uh, occurrences. And we also commiserate mm -hmm. with the families, uh, relatives of those that lost their life at the train attack. Uh, well, fortunately, this is where we'll draw the mm -hmm. curtains for today's edition of The Conversation right here on New Central TV. Do join us again on Friday for another edition. And don't forget, the conversation does not just end here. You can also join us on YouTube at New Central TV, on Twitter, on all our social media accounts at New Central TV for uh, The Conversation. And Benga Borrow, I'll see you next time on The Conversation. <laughs>